Often we describe our childhood trauma in like big bullet points. Like for me, it was like alcoholic parents, emotional abuse, physical abuse, chaos, codependency, neglect, like these big things. But what exists between these big bullet points is like the everyday trauma, the like day in the life trauma, like the moments from one moment to the next, not so much like these loud, big in your face events. Like you're five and you wanna connect with your parent by asking them questions or show them a drawing or share your thoughts and they just meet you with like contempt or disinterest. And all of that tells a story about the parenting that I think goes way deeper than those bullet points. So you can use this video as a resource for your own parenting, if you have kids, and if you grew up in childhood trauma, or you can simply use this as a resource to explore and identify how you were parented in your own childhood trauma. Um, we all need to process and look at the abusive parenting we experience because I think it still affects us in our present life. And it will until we kind of deal with it, I think. And I'll give concrete examples of what I mean as we go through this list. If you're new to me or new to the channel, welcome. If you like this video, feel free to hit some buttons on the screen. You really can't miss with any of the buttons, especially the like or the subscribe button, which greatly supports the channel and creates a wider community around the channel. And if these videos are helpful to you and helpful to your recovery, you can consider supporting the work that goes into these videos over at my Patreon. And in addition, you can go to my website up here to do some childhood trauma e-course work that I offer there, including um, an upcoming webinar in April that I'll be hosting. It's going to be a live webinar on the topic of overcoming our toxic family system. And you can learn all about it at this little link up here. In addition, in support of Ukrainians living through this trauma as we speak, I'm working with therapists that are available to do some free pro bono Zoom sessions with you for some support. You can connect with me through my Instagram, well actually really connect with me through my website which is a better place to get me. If you're a Ukrainian fleeing Ukraine or you're stuck in Ukraine, please reach out to me and maybe we can get you a counselor. Um, and I will have all the links in the below in the description to this video. So I'm gonna walk through 10 examples of toxic parenting that really isn't widely known of or isn't really widely thought of in the grand scheme of things. And with each one, I'll talk through three things. I'm gonna talk through defining the toxic behavior, I'm gonna talk about how it affects us as adults growing up in it in the long run. And then I'm also gonna be adding what would be the healthy opposite of this toxic behavior. So let's begin. Um, number one is not acknowledging reality or really like denying reality. And yes, this could be looked at as gaslighting, but it's got some differences. Some examples, not acknowledging that say the grandparent is dangerous or scary or is enraged during a visit anybody, like a grandparent, a step-parent, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, when, the, when your parent is completely ignoring that reality. Not acknowledging major changes in family life, like a divorce or a loss of a job, um, or that one of the parents is having an affair um, and everyone kind of knows about, and even ag not acknowledging disasters, emotional disasters, natural disasters, economic ones, not being real about what the child sees inside and outside of the home. Um, and a more extreme example, a trigger warning here, is I've had clients that knew that their parent was having an affair because the parent brought their kids to their lover's house, even though that they're still married with somebody else, and even had their kids play with like the lover's kids, you know, like you be, weirded out how actually common that is for childhood trauma and childhood trauma and dysfunctional families. A lesser extreme version is when parents um, emotionally divorce themselves from their from their from their partner, but they stay together in the facade of a marriage for the sake of the kids. You really can't hide something like that. And this is related to another item on the list that I'm gonna talk about later. Not acknowledging reality can range from the parent being shut down or compartmentalized. But what I find of it, it's often done to children out of convenience. Like not acknowledging a fair despite the children knowing that something was extremely off is about the parent's convenience to not do so. So the long-term effects on this one for for, for those of us that grow up in it is we really struggle with trusting people's motives or trust that they're going to be honest with us. It can be it can be quite the shock in therapy when we go into our story and we see the smoke and mirrors of all of all that 
not being in reality by our parents. And we can also not trust our own reality and make up excuses or live in magical thinking because that was somewhat modeled for us. Aside from the obvious about what would be healthier is simply addressing like uncomfortable changes and issues by addressing the elephants in our lives and this, in these families that we're growing up in. But the, the real healthy piece here is letting our children know about the issues in age appropriate ways. A teen is much better prepared to handle the reality of say an affair or a divorce, but a grammar school age child will struggle with all that, but it's still important to find ways to inform them, but really let them know that despite that reality that they are still safe and secure with you in that disclosing about what's actually going on. And it's crucial that we don't continue generational trauma around our children's perception. And I think that we can boil childhood trauma down to two things, disconnection, like attachment stuff, and abuse around our perception about how we see the world and how we see ourselves. And it's all that like you're a bad kid and you're a burden. All of that stuff really affects us. So moving on to number two is what I call, well, you get that from your mother. <laughs> and this is a toxic trait that can both be character assassinating the other parent, and it also dooms the child to be like that parent. Even if it's done in a teasing way, it still cuts and dishonors that child's relationship with the other parent, even if that relationship isn't really good. Like, let's just say you're being raised by a single parent and they just sort of kind of trash talk your biological other parent um, without having even met them. It's still going to affect us in a way that we're a reflection upon them. So some examples, you're a teen. <laughs> uh, growing up being told that I was like my dad's side of the family was a terrible thing. And it also made my mother's maiden name and that side of the family like the better family. Like, well, you're a typical Smith or well, you're definitely not a Johnson, like that stuff. Um, you're a BS artist, just like your father or your mother. Um, you have no sense in you, just like your father. Well, don't up like any one of those Thompsons, you'll end up in jail. Um, why this is so toxic is it creates an us versus them dynamic, as well as almost something like, they're kind of like doomed veiled threats, like don't end up in jail, just like, you know, so-and-so. Let's not be overly literal here. So if it's, if it's celebratory, like, you know, you have your mother's eyes, you have beautiful eyes or something like that, it's totally fine. Um, it's fine when there isn't this gross ulterior motive behind it going on. Why this is bad is essentially shame. Children somewhat, I think they somewhat assume that they are an extension of both of their parents. So bad mouthing or predicting that they're gonna end up like this other parent takes away their future and it also takes away their goodness. It also portrays as whoever is saying this stuff as a victim, like don't end up like a teen, they'll ruin your life, trust me. <laughs> um, it, it can also be explored or to counter that, it can be explored, well, why did you marry a Smith? If you had such problems with them, don't you have a part to play in this? The opposite of this toxic trait is if you can't celebrate the child's name or you can't celebrate the connection to the other side of the family or you can't celebrate positive inherited traits or you can't not make it about you, don't say anything about this stuff. A lot of good parenting starts with filtering and don't we shouldn't be using our children as an audience to kind of prove to them how the world has wronged us. So there's that. Number three is insulting our children's intelligence. Directly related to the first one that I did, um, some examples to this, and these are, these are gonna be gaslighty. Telling them that you're not mad when you clearly are, like being passive aggressive. Telling them you love them, but your behavior doesn't back that up. Like you love them, but you never go to their games. Telling them that you and your partner are just discussing something when it was clearly like a rage filled fight with scary energy. Or lying to them about what your kids clearly see. Or making excuses for your off behavior or the off behavior of other adults. Or covering things up when the other parent lets the children down like you know oh you know your father loves you even though he totally ghosted you today and made you wait for like six hours that kind of a thing i know this sounds like an attack on parenting and i don't mean it to be so parenting is extremely hard 
say like um, what what do you tell your five year old when that when the, your co parent does ghost them um, and really lets them down you know I get all that so try to not take these as personal attacks on you some a trigger warning with this example here I saw this powerful video of a guy talking about how his mother and his stepfather were fighting in the front seat of the car they're all driving and the stepfather grabbed the wheel away from the mother and they got in this horrific accident because they were arguing about which way to go somewhere and the mother later said to this guy that how lucky the whole family was that it was actually a pastor that took them to the hospital instead of having to go with the paramedics or that kind of a thing like it was some kind of you know like sign to the mother that that happened um, and what the gentleman was talking about is that that story from the mom and not being real about the stepfather it ins insulted his intelligence about we what he already knows about his stepfather that the stepfather nearly killed everyone because he was a psychopath and i really resonated with that story that he was sort of telling related to this one so children are extremely perceptive um, and they are extremely intelligent. They just, you know, they just, they haven't really lost their kind of curiosity about the world or their ability to kind of call out BS. And they are actually really attuned to their caretakers. They know it's up, but they can't articulate it like an adult would. The long-term effects of this one is that children, um, tend to not trust their inner compass. We grow up and we're not great judges of character, um, which gets us into great trouble. And we're easily manipulated and we can easily buy into somebody else's BS. The opposite of this one is our job as parents is to cultivate our children's perception, not warp it for our own selfish reasons. That scout leader or teacher who is actually a bit of a bully or a pain in the ass, that our other parent did let us down and that you can actually talk about it and that the adults did make unsafe and selfish decisions just to be real about it this is what this one is really about number four is being threatened by a child's emotions this one is rooted when a parent only tolerates neutral energy or neutral expression from their children and they just want compliance from their children it's like the old children should be seen and not heard kind of a vibe when a child is disappointed or scared or terrified or sad or even happy the child is attacked like what are you so happy about don't start with me on that i'm scared bs or help me god you know like um what it's just a goldfish it's just there's no big effing deal come on you know or don't you dare give me that look you know it tells us that the parent is ill-suited to be able to mirror and be present with their children's and be present for their children's emotions and actually when you look at it it doesn't really look like they're threatened by those emotions in their children but why are they so reactive to basic normal kid emotions in my case for par my parents were ex extremely reactive with us to our normal feelings because they were hung over most days and that I reminded them that their life didn't in fact revolve around a bar. My emotions threatened their reality or their lack thereof. It can also be a threat to them because it reminds them of their failures or it kind of pokes the veil, which is kind of worse. Like when you're scared of the abusive step parent and your parent is abusive around your fear, it might be that you are kind of the canary in the coal mine over the whole situation and they don't like that. That's a lot of stuff to process in therapy around this. Um, you're making it real for them, and that is what is threatening to them. The long-term effects here is that most trauma survivors feel like their emotions are both wrong and that they're too much for others. And that was very much true given how we were parented or how our parents reacted to our normal emotions. So there's a lot of reclaiming to do around that. The opposite of this is just to check out how our children's feelings are actually triggering us. What is the fear about regarding their emotions? Is the fear about not knowing how to validate or help them through their emotions? Is it the trigger around feeling like your children are going through what you went through? Is the, is the fear around that they're kind of poking through the veil in some ways and you're actually not doing as well as you think you are? 
like all of that stuff to reflect on. And as a side note, I'm not saying that every single emotion and expression of our children is the most paramount thing in the world. Sometimes whining, which is super annoying, is simply whining, but you can allow space and care for your child to be sad or to be scared or disappointed. Like no one's gonna die if they feel those feelings. Moving on to number five is unnecessary power struggles. Healthy kids are gonna test limits. Neglected kids are gonna test if the parents are gonna show up for them. And all forms of childhood trauma have some form of abuse of power. Even that is probably around all trauma in the human condition is a rooted in abuse of power, I think. An unnecessary power struggle is coming up with arbitrary rules that are really just about reminding the child that they don't really have any power and the adult does. Some examples to passive aggressively take something away or not let your kids go do something, and I'm gonna date myself here, but no, you can't go to the mall because I said so. No, you can't hang out with that kid, I said so. You can only be friends with the kids from church. No, I don't care what your teacher said that you got the lead, I don't want you to be in that play. Um, no, you're just gonna sit there and apologize to me. No, um, you have to agree with me on this thing. Um, you don't respect my things, I don't respect your things. Power struggles are really unnecessary ones, are really about getting back at your kid. Like think tit for tat, setting them up to fail um, and then say like I told you so. This is a marked parenting style around unnecessary control really. And as a side note, parenting is actually really extremely hard. And you might have an extremely strong-willed child or even a defiant child, but the rules here still apply. And sometimes not having your child hang out with someone because of valid concerns that you have is a good thing. But are you explaining it in a certain way or are you just saying no because I'm the parent? The long-term effects of unnecessary power struggles is childhood trauma survivors can experience shame when they make choices for themselves or find themselves in scapegoated roles that maybe you put them in because um, they didn't fit into the toxic parents like limited parameters. A scapegoat might become totally compliant as an adult or totally rebellious as an adult and both are really not good for them. So what's the opposite? A healthy parent is the teacher and the guide. Your kid might be at their worst, whether they're like at three or they're 13, but you still have to be modeling healthy disagreements, healthy communication, not use power for power's sake, which is really about what this one is about, and explaining your decisions while hearing them out. Like the trick here is to still value what the child wanted to experience, even if you're saying no. I know you wanted to hang out with them, but I don't know their family well enough. But when I do, we can certainly come back to that. That's the opposite of that one. Moving on, is it your kid or is it your parenting? Well, you screwed that up. Well, pretty typical, you didn't make the team this year. Uh, well, you're definitely not, not like my firstborn. Um, uh, you sure didn't pick up on what I was getting at. Um, well, you'll never make it as an artist. And I know all that is straight up toxic criticism, but there is usually a dynamic behind all that, which is about how the parent shows up to basic parenting. Many trauma survivors are criticized on adult levels while not getting any parental help from their parents. Um, to flip the narrative, then maybe that kid didn't make the team because they only made it to one or half of the tryouts because the parents didn't get it together enough to get them to those tryouts. Um, may, they aren't like the firstborn because maybe the firstborn is a golden child and the parents put all the resources in that child and now they're kind of lazy and apathetic to their younger children. Um, you'll never make it as an artist is probably maybe really about the parent not being invested and expecting Monet from an eight-year-old who just wanted to learn how to sketch. So it's not the type of kid Toxic parents love, love, love to put their children in inferior roles uh, to them while being totally negligent about helping their children be consistent and the parent is supposed to be the resource about consistency. Did you practice your scales today versus, well, Carne Carnegie Hall ain't in your future. Um, we can't expect children to perform like adults and children need a lot of help. And yes, a 13-year-old will tell you about the tryout at the last minute. 
and you can't be omnipotent, but we also can't fully expect a 13 year old to have all of that in a shared Google calendar with the GPS location in their phone ready to go and like let you know a week ahead of time. So that's kind of what I mean about the difference between parenting is really a pain in the ass, but it's not, we can't expect that 13 year old to be an adult. The long term effects on this one, childhood trauma survivors will really wrestle with taking risk and making changes. Um, this is top tier trauma symptoms in my mind, stuff like imposter syndrome, terrified to start new jobs, complete shock if they're picked for a team or if a painting sells, like we shouldn't be shocked. Their image of performing and trying really got damaged by, by the parental stuff. The opposite of this is to really educate ourselves as parents to know that parenting is really constant repetition as children need constant help until they become self-sufficient much later. My son who's 10, he's been asked and told to put the, the towel on the floor back on the back on the curtain rod. He's 10, he's been probably been hearing that for about like five years now. He never does it. <laughs> <laughs> he never does it without being reminded, and that's age appropriate. It's what I'm getting at with that one. And lastly, being unable to, this one might seem really different to the other ones, being unable to assert ourselves as a parent. This one can be easily summed up with Cartman's mom, if you're familiar with the cartoon. The parent who is scared to have a certain tone or put their foot down for fear of being abusive, or that assuming their child will just get the message without assertion can really set the child up for not knowing where boundaries and limits are. Some examples, not asserting authority when a sibling is abusing the other kid, not modeling boundaries with other adults, like the parent can't say to note it to anything or anybody, not being able to guide kids through transitions, and I mean that with younger children, like you, if you can't assert yourself with a toddler, have a firm voice or a commanding voice, still gentle and stuff, it's like, that's what I mean. Transitions become excruciating where it's just drawn out. Those of you with, with small children would probably know what I'm talking about. Where sometimes, even with a toddler, you literally have to pick them up in mid tantrum and get them out of the daycare because it's closing. That's what I mean by that. Um, I'm not talking about being abusive. I'm talking about being firm and in charge. This is where power can really be a slippery slope, but you need to be firm if your six-year-old is running around with scissors at a birthday party and is too jazzed up to listen to you. They're gonna need a commanding voice to like redirect. I find the parent who has this going on is an excellent candidate for assertion training or some therapy, and it's, it's a pretty fixable problem, but it can also be really damaging when it comes to the child respecting the parent, like having our children respect us as people. The long-term issues is we can grow up into adults, this, is, this one's weird, and not really know where the line is. We can grow up knowing that we can take advantage of others if we want to. We can grow up actually with some rage in reserve that I think comes from not getting this level of guidance from a parent, not respecting the parent. We can grow into adults who struggle with taking direction since we've run the show for so long. Like I leave when I'm ready to leave, not when somebody tells me, like that kind of stuff. As a side note, if you're easy, breezy, gentle, but you can still be firm and, li and get your kids to listen to you, you're in the clear. Uh, this one is really for parents who confuse being firm with being abusive, like they really can't tell the difference. Um, if this video is helpful to you, I would love to hear if you have questions or comments. I would love to hear those as well. One of my favorite, favorite books about parenting is by a woman named Janet Wojtitz, who wrote a book called Healthy Parenting. It's a book that I use in my own childhood trauma groups in my group work, and I'll have the link to that book in the description of this video below. And please check out the bubble up here about that webinar coming up in April. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be joyous. And I will see you next time. Take care.